All right, Edi Amin, how's it going? Hey, man, it's going good, man. I can't complain. How about you? Good. Good, man. Grinding, good man. Good you know, shit. Same uh, here. Glad to have you. Glad we can get this done for you, man. Yeah, yeah. definitely, man. You know, I mean, your uh, history in hip-hop is, is very extensive, man, and, uh, you know, very significant to hip-hop and everything that happened, you know, through, through uh, you know what I'm saying, your time and everything you did, man, so... I'm just glad to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. For sure, for sure, man. Well, I thought I would jump into some of the kind of big, kind of news that came out, man. I don't know how real it is or not, but, you know, uh, RBX did an interview with Art of Dialogue. And in this interview, he actually said that Tupac got jumped into Mob Pyru. Is there any truth to that? No. Never happened. Never happened. Okay. Not at all. Let me ask you a question. Do you think all your viewers uh, propose a question to them? Do they think Tupac was the kind of individual that would allow himself to be jumped so he can be in a gang? And no disrespect to anybody that lived that life and that's been, you know, jumped in. I understand it. I've been out here long enough to understand the culture and, and, and why they believe in what they believe in. Tupac was a different individual. There's no scenario on this planet that would allow that to happen, or he would allow that to happen. So no. Now, he was tied to the mob, though? I mean, you know, which I mean, I think is pretty well documented. He was signed to death row. He was signed to death row, absolutely. He was signed to death row, and he was loyal to the people that threw him a lifeline when he was sitting in a cell and, um, you know, just trying to f figure it out. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about people saying that Tupac shouldn't have joined Death Row and that, like, Suge and everything that came with it was, like, a bad influence on him? Opinions are like assholes. Everybody got their opinion. And they have a right to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tupac did what he did in this history. He made history. It's a part of history. Definitely, definitely, man. I, I mean, do you agree with that, or do you feel like it was like... My opinion really, really really, doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not. At the time, obviously, I agree with it because I went with him. You know what I mean? We had a whole situation with Interscope that we was working on, and that came to an abrupt end as soon as Pac was like, yo, I'm getting out of jail and I'm going to death row. And we was all like, let's go. So you were on Interscope too with him? We was about to do a deal with Interscope. Like I said, we were working on something. Yeah, we had did a whole album and the whole shit. Okay. So this was, okay, so when he was in jail, you guys were still, you guys were working. Absolutely. Prior to him going to jail. Okay. Did any of that music ever come out? It's all over the internet. You can find it. That whole album is on the internet. Okay. Yeah. Real Pac Outlaw fans know what it is, and they, they know that project is... It got leaked a long time ago. Well, there's been so much stuff leaked, you know what I mean? I don't, you know, I don't You're right know about that, what. brother. You're right about that. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot, man. Okay, so I, I thought we'd probably kind of take it back, man, and, and, you know what I'm saying, to where, you know, you first grew up. You know what I'm saying? Where, where'd you grow up at? I grew up in a couple of different places. I started off in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, to be exact. Um, and then I moved. I moved to the Midwest for a little while and eventually landed in the West Coast. And that was a part of me growing up, that, you know, a little bit of the South Atlanta. What was growing up like for you? Um, growing up for me was, you know, I guess you would say typical for a young black kid, growing up without a father, single parent home. Obviously, mom doing most of the heavy lifting, you know, um, me and my other brother. But I was surrounded by love. I was surrounded by love and, you know, affection. And, you know, even though my surroundings and where I was at might have been harsh and less than desirable, I was always surrounded by love and, and, and always encouraged to be the best that I can be by the people who had influence over me. And at what point did you meet Tupac? Um, it's hard to say when I met Tupac because I, we've known each other, 
I I knew I know knew him all my life. So I don't even remember the exact day. It was just like your family, if you got a cousin or somebody, you know what I mean? Y'all just grow up together. It's just, it was family. Our families were closely connected in a few different ways. How many years apart are you guys? Tupac would, would, was uh, about three, three and a half, four years older than me. Okay. So, I, I mean, when you met, were you in Brooklyn when you guys met or? Yeah, New York City. New York Whether City. it was Brooklyn, the Bronx, Harlem, you know what I mean? We were, we were, uh, we were kids, so we was, what? We was we were wherever our parents were, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we didn't we didn't have much of a you know decision making on that, but yeah, New York City. Let's just say that. Okay. Yeah. So this would have been like when Tupac was like po doing the poetry and and all that type of stuff. Yeah, it, it could even be before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was Tupac like always like the standout type of kid? Like you kind of like always seen. Like, did he, he had that, like, id factor? Absolutely. He definitely had a spark, a light, whatever you call it, the mojo. You know what I mean? The saucy, whatever it is, he had it. You know what I mean? From a, um, from a young, young, very young age. And was always our, you know, um, the younger, when I say our, I mean the younger kids in the family, like Gaddafi, myself, Castro. You know, we always looked up to him. He was always our big brother. At what point did he start to rap, or did you notice, like, he had a passion for music? It, around the time, he was calling himself MC New York. You know what I mean? He was, uh, but Pac was always just a natural performer, always in the music. It just, you know, I can't really pinpoint an exact age or whatever. It just was always there for as long as I can remember. What about the acting? Was that always there too? Always there. Just came naturally. Do you remember like any of his first rhymes or anything like that? Was I heard he nah, was battling? Man. I don't remember any of his first rhymes, man. But you know, he was uh, you know, LL Cool J was big around that time, and he was, you know, influenced by a lot of what LL was doing. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, that kind of MC, I guess he was. You would call him, you know what I mean? Real bravado, braggadocious type shit. What about battling? I heard he battled a lot. I wasn't privy to that. I don't, you know what I mean? Um, but we all did at that time. That was kind of like the, the 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 customary thing to do in hip hop in those earlier days, in the early 80s. You know what I mean? So, you know, whether you was having a battle on the street, you was having a battle in your house, hip hop was born and raised and bred it on competition. It's almost like a sport. At what point did you start rapping? Around the same time, you know what I mean? I started rapping in the early 80s. I started rapping and taking it very seriously, you know, by the time I was about 13 years old. Okay, Tupac moves to the West Coast out uh, over to Oakland or the Bay Area. Now, where are you at during this time? Are you still, are you in Atlanta at this time? No, I was in Minnesota, actually. I was in the Midwest. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now he moves out here and, you know, he starts going to high school and, uh, you know, he starts working with Digital Underground. Were you guys working together this time or? Nah, uh-uh. Okay. Nah, he was doing his thing and I was doing my thing. Still kids, you know what I mean? So, trying to figure it out. At what point did you guys link back up? 92. Link back up in 92. I had said Pac some of my demos, some of the stuff that I was working on. Um, me and Castro would, would uh, you know, always envision ourselves being in the hip-hop game and at that time he was he was getting you know his feet wet in the business going on the road with digital underground appeared on same song did juice and um yeah so i sent him some of my music he liked what he heard obviously and uh my career started in the summer of 92 flew out to oakland were you staying with tupac at the time yeah yep okay what was that like um, shit, man, we was, we was getting it out the mud, you know what I mean? Tupac was still very much a new artist, still figuring his way out in the music business and, uh, the movie business, you know, um, his star was on the rise, but there wasn't like gobs of money and, you know, bright lights and all this shit. It was really grind. It was a grind, you know what I mean? He was still grinding. We was grinding with him.
So this was right after Juice. A lot of people say the Tupac changed after Juice. How do you feel about that? Hmm. Like he became more Bishop. I mean, for me, I don't, I don't see where they would make that connection. You know what I mean? One, one is a character that he played, and another guy is a human being. And um, you know, those that usually comes from people that, in my opinion, really didn't know him that well. Okay. Now, at one point, Tupac is in Atlanta, and I, get, I think he's in a limo, and I believe you're with him, and he sees two white dudes jumping a black dude. And this is when he shoots the two off-duty cops? Mm -hmm. Can you kind of take me through what happened? Yeah, well, you know, um, you kind of telling the movie version as far as the limo and shit. It, it, we weren't in a limo. Pac had... Uh, just bought a brand new BMW, and that's what we were in. It was homecoming. He had did a show, you know what I'm saying? So we were already there. We all gathered up, went to the show together, did the show, come back to the hotel, typical hip-hop shit, you know what I mean? Caravanning, women, men, go to the hotel. It's time to have a good time, you know what I mean? Great show. In the process of doing that, we ran into an altercation, and, um, we was really just trying to get to the room, really was trying to just get past that, really didn't know what was going on, but um, some piqued Pac's interest. And I was the, the, the two, you know, Caucasian gentlemen whipping this black dude's ass, you know, pretty thoroughly. They was doing a pretty good job on him. And, uh, you know what I mean? At first, Pac was on some move out the way shit, and then it was like, hold on, you know what I mean? So, one thing led to another, guns were drawn, some other weapons came out, shots were fired, they ended up with a um, couple of ass shots from a pretty good distance, pretty, pretty good distance. Now, Tupac eventually gets arrested for this. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what all happens when he gets arrested? Does he bail out? I, I I don't, I don't really... Shit, bro. You asking me some shit I don't remember. That was a long time ago. He, I, he, he had to have bailed out. You know what I mean? Because he definitely didn't stay in jail until this shit went to court. So he, he had to have bonded out at some point. Pretty quickly, too. I think it was, you know, he wasn't in jail for more than 24 hours. Do you remember what the outcome of the case was? Yeah, the, the, the case was dismissed on the strength of the cops where, you know... Um, have found that have been, you know, a little, little dirty. You know, um, the gun that they had uh, was taken out of an evidence room. It, it was basically a stolen, stolen, and um, some other things came out about them. And that was one of the cases that Pac did, you know, come out on top. How surprised were you guys to learn that these were two off-duty cops? <sighs> Pretty, pretty, um, pretty surprised. But in retrospect, when you look at the situation and the individuals, now nah, it wasn't surprising. You know what I mean? You, you know how you see some, you see some people. You be like, man, that, that motherfucker look like he could be a cop. You know what I mean? You know, we was like, damn, it, it makes sense. You know what I mean? Because even the way they was doing the uh, the guy who was getting beat up, they was doing it like how cops beat up beat your ass, you know what I'm saying? When it, they was, it, was, it was cop style. Yeah. But at the time, obviously, we didn't know that because we was in the moment. Yeah. How did Tupac feel when, when everything got dim dismissed and everything? I mean, it was, he breathed a sigh of relief, I'm sure, you know what I mean? Because he had a lot of cases at that time that he was dealing with, and that was one that, you know, he can get off, you know what I mean? Years later, they actually sued. They, they sued after he passed away, his estate. Those cops sued Pac. Really? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. Did they, What do you know what the outcome of it was? I'm not going to say it on camera, but yeah, they sued. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the nerve, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> They're over here beating someone up, breaking the law, doing this crooked shit, and now they want to sue. Yep. Damn. Damn, that's crazy, man.
you know, a lot, a lot of, there's a lot of negativity. You know what I'm saying? Tupac had a lot of controversy. But, you know, what are some of the good times you guys had? You know what I'm saying? I think I seen a picture of you guys all in Hawaii one time. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. definitely one of them. Yeah, great time. All our first times going to Hawaii. Actually, that that trip was paid for by not only Tupac, but my cousin. You know what I'm saying? My cousin at the time. And, uh, you know, they were both young, having a lot of money. Just woke up one day like, fuck it, let's go to Hawaii. You know what I'm saying? And before I knew it, we were packing our bags and on a flight to Hawaii. And as a matter of fact, Pac had a show out there. So we was just like, we're going to go all go out there and, and, you know, check out Hawaii. It was a lot of our first time going. So, you know, we had a great time. And memorable stories or anything from that time you could share? Man, just riding around Hawaii on scooters, man. You know what I'm saying? We was just going all over the place taking pictures. A lot of those pictures have made it to the internet and you could just see us, you know what I mean? We was just really just touring the island, just riding around on scooters everywhere, having a good time. Did you ever see Tupac and Eazy-E together? No, I never had that privilege, man. That would have been something else, man. Okay, yeah, yeah. I heard, I, I, you know, I heard about it. I heard that, you know, there was they possibly talked about signing him or something early on or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, back when he was in a group with uh, Ray Love called Strictly Dope. I think they were on the verge of... Uh, possibly doing something. I know I, know, I had heard that Easy was inter- interested in them as a group mm. because of, uh, I think their role manager at the time eventually became Tupac's manager, and I was a gentleman by the name of Atrian Gregory. Okay. Tupac also does the album with Thug Life. Mm-hmm. Were you around for that part at all? Here and there. Here and there? Yeah. Okay. And there was a lot of members from Thug Life. You know how did you know how that group came together? That group came together um, because uh, Pac had a relationship with a, with a cat from LA that uh, that knew you know Pac had been coming to LA before he was even famous. You know what I'm saying? He had people out here that he was um, cool with that were like family. And so he always had a connection to L.A. even before he ended up living out here and eventually, you know, calling it his home. And so those connections led to different people in the group like Big Sight. And then also, you know, um, Macadocious Rated R. They had a connection through Coolio, who Pac was cool with. Rest in peace to Coolio. And so, you know, Pac had wanted to put this group together. And, and you know, he had this idea and this concept that he had been working on and playing and, and, and playing with in his mind prior to Thug Life. If, if you notice, he had a tattoo called 50 Niggas. And so 50 Niggas is kind of like the precursor to what Thug, Thug Life eventually became, including the whole ideology. Okay, uh, you mentioned the tattoo, man. At what point does he get the Thug Life t- tattoo? Shit, it's around the same time, you know what I mean? It's around the early 90s, along with the formation of the group Thug Life. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's in that area. I don't remember the year or, or date or anything, but it's definitely around that same time period. Did he ever talk to you about the tattoo? Nah, not like personally, like, yo, check out my tattoo. It was just, you know what I mean, something that he did. And, you know what I mean, it was... uh. It was unheard of in hip hop at the time. Like nobody had a fucking tattoo going across their stomach. You know what I mean? People weren't even really into tattoos that much. And so it immediately just, you know, set him apart from the pack as far as, you know, the early parts of branding in hip hop artists. Pac was branding himself. Of course, at the time, we didn't know that. He was just doing what came natural to him, but he became the blueprint for what a lot of other rappers eventually started doing yeah it's an iconic tattoo yeah you know what i mean like very uh very popular mm-hmm. uh, definitely inspired a lot of people 100 percent. you know you mentioned uh the blueprint you know him in playing the blueprint for people man um you know how, how do you feel when you see a lot of people kind of or you know especially at, you know after he passed away a lot of people you know kind of followed tupac and you know what i'm saying kind of uh like you said, t- you know, took his blueprint and everything. How did you feel seeing all that? 
Yeah, man, at the time, we wasn't really happy about the shit, you know what I'm saying? Because we were still kind of young and still uh, in our feelings about everything that happened. And so, you know, when we saw it, nah, we wasn't happy about the shit at all. But you understand as time goes on that there has to be a Jordan and then there has to be a Kobe and a whole bunch of other little, you know, cats that are influenced by greatness. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's what's up, man. Well, November 30th, uh, 1995, Tupac is going to uh, record a verse for somebody, and he ends up getting shot five times. Uh, mm. Were you in Nor New York around that time? Nah, uh-uh. I was in Atlanta. Okay. Now, how did you hear about that, and did you head to New York after you Nah, we got shot? a phone call. We got a phone call. And it, it, we just got a phone call saying Pac had been shot. Um, he was he was okay, but he was going to the hospital because he needed to get surgery. And um, that's how we found out. You know what I mean? And we didn't head to New York right away, but eventually we did get up there. Okay. And what happens when you get to New York? It was just really about, um, you know, being supportive because he was going through a lot at that time. He had been shot and he was uh, on trial. Okay. Tupac, you know, and not too long after that, he goes to jail. And I believe you guys visited him a lot in jail. Mm hmm Okay, what, what was that kind of time like for you guys and, and for him and, you know? It was tough, man. You know what I'm saying? If you've ever had, to, had a loved one incarcerated, you understand that that's a tough, uh, it's tough for them on the inside and it's tough for the people that care for him, especially a, a spirit and a guy like Tupac, who was a free spirit, you know what I mean? You never want to see anybody in the cell, but especially somebody like that. So it was tough. Did Tupac ever come to you and talk to you guys about signing to death row, you know, when he was in jail? Or was it like a surprise, like, oh, Nah, shit. it definitely was a surprise, you know what I mean? We had um, heard about, you know, him and Suge talking and, it was a possibility, and you know, before we know it, he was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, I did the deal. I'm doing the deal, and we going to death row." Okay. Now, uh, we were talking about Tupac signing to death row mm -hmm. uh, when he was in prison, man. I interviewed uh, Tupac's ex, and she had said that Tupac told her that when he signed the deal, that he was signing, you know, himself to the devil. Did you ever get any of that from Tupac or anything, or how did he feel about things when he signed? Nah, he didn't. He didn't verbalize that to us. Okay. Now he gets out of prison, and you know, uh, where are you at at this time? Do you, you know how how soon before you meet up with Tupac in L.A.? It was a couple of weeks, man. We was in Atlanta, so he gets out of prison, and then you know, he, everybody heard the stories. He went right back to work, got right back in the studio, started working on what would eventually become All Eyes on Me. And uh, Gaddafi, Hussein Fatal from the Outlaws, they went out there first, and then the rest of us came a couple weeks later. And what do you do as soon as you get there? Do you hit the, right, hit the studio? Let's get to work, man. It's just, it's just about getting to work. It's just about, you know what I mean, making sure that whatever we could do to make his comeback a monumental one and, you know, a, um, a game-changing one possible. So, okay, so Tupac gets out of jail. You guys meet up. And do you remember, like, what you felt like when you started hearing the new music he was making? How I felt? Yeah. Man, I was excited, man, because I knew, you know, um, with Death Row's production, it was going to take Pac to a whole nother level. You know, at that time, Death Row was the sound of, of, of the music industry. You know what I mean? Everybody was trying to have a death row sounding type record, just the quality. You know what I mean? Just the quality of the production that was coming out of death row at, at that time was just top tier. And so for me as an artist and as a, as a wannabe producer, a budding producer, I was always in tune to what the music sound like, what Pac's music sound like. And from the beginning of his career, to that point, he was on an upward trajectory. You know what I mean? Me Against the World, I came out prior to that, and it was great. It was a number one album. Some of his best productions, some of his best songs was on that project. So just excited, like, yeah, okay, 
It's getting even better. He records California Love at one point. Mm -hmm. And were you there for that? Yeah. Can you kind of take me through through that or through that day or, you know what I'm saying, how everything happened? Well, Drake came with a beat. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was that. And Pac was like, yo, I need that. You know what I mean? And Drake was like, I, I, I ain't fuck it. And then they went in there, you know what I mean? And Dre was at the boards doing what he do. You know what I mean? I was in the corner just trying not to be noticed, you know what I mean? And, and just I just wanted to be, be there and watch greatness happen. I knew this was history, you know what I mean? That big of a record with Pac on it, just coming out of jail, forget about it. I seen somewhere that like Tupac was like hyped to work with Dr. Dre. Like, did Tupac like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what was Tupac's thoughts on Dr. Dre like before that? Yeah, hell yeah. I mean, shit, Dre, wouldn't you be hyped? The fuck hell it? yeah. <laughs> Legend. Yeah, man. Yeah, very excited. And you can hear it on California Love. You can hear the excitement in the music. All you got to do is listen. Okay. At, at what point, you know, things kind of start to go sideways with Dr. Dre, man? You know, do you know, like, where you noticed where things kind of went bad with him? I mean, for, from, from our perspective, you got to understand, we weren't privy to a lot of this shit that was going on behind the scenes. You know what I'm saying? We the little homies. We just we the soldiers. We just playing opposition. You know what I mean? So for us, it went from, you know, um, being on the set of the California Love remix video, Dre happy, Dre, you know, everything is lovely. You know what I mean? So much to the point that Pac was like, yo, Dre want to holla at y'all. We like... What? Dre wanna holla at us? Pac like, yeah, Dre wanna holla at us. We wanna go chop it up with Dre real quick. Long story short, Dre, Dre had told Pac that he wanted to direct, you know what I mean, the hit him up video. You know what I'm saying? Because he was, he was fucking with it so tough. He was fucking with our music so tough. And we standing there chopping it up with Dre. Now Dre, you know, he done had a couple drinks in him. Everybody has. It's the California Love 2 video. You know what I mean? You got models, celebrities. It's, it's like a big ass party that's just, a video you go back and watch that video you can see we having a very good time you know what i'm saying and just it's not acting everybody was really you know what i mean having a good time and so yeah dre was just like yo woom, 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 this is what i want to do you know what i mean like yo y'all y'all the new nwa y'all remind me of us you know what i'm saying like yeah i'm fucking with it and then a couple of weeks later Pac like yo dre dre leaving death row man and we like oh no video? Damn. <laughs> mm. How often did you see Dr. Dre around death row? Very little. Okay. Very little, because Dre had his own studio. You know what I mean? It's Dr. fucking Dre, so that nigga had a studio in his crib. He wasn't really, you know what I'm saying? And at the time, you know, um, k and wasn't always, you know, I would say conducive to a creative <laughs> such as Dre to really be able to do what he do. You know what I'm saying? It was a lot of, it's a lot going on. And so, yeah, you, we didn't see Dre much. And then eventually he leaves death row, you know what I mean? Goes on the greener pasture, so to speak. Now, I interviewed uh, Kendrick and uh, Kendrick Wells, and he had mentioned that he felt like Tupac was under a lot of pressure before All Eyes On Me dropped, uh, you know, they put up the bail money. They had a lot of money riding on Pac, man. You know, how, how do you feel about that? Was that was that something you seen or something that you noticed? Nah, not at all. You know, he didn't show that, you know, um, to us. Now, if he was dealing with a lot of pressure, you know, under the surface, Unfortunately, he's not here to answer that question himself. But for us, we didn't see that. We saw somebody that was happy to be getting out of prison. You know what I'm saying? Um, happy to get back to his career. Happy to be able to uh, continue providing for his family. Dr. Dre leaves death row. And what changes in death row when Dr. Dre leaves? What changes in death row? Well, you know, for us, it's kind of hard to say that because the, the, for me, it's kind of hard to say that because that time period where we got to death row and Dre left was a very short period of time. You know what I mean? I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it was a short period of time. For, so for me to know what death row was like prior to and then after, it's kind of hard to say because Dre wasn't really around that much 
when we got there and then he was gone. And so death row was pretty much just, you know, one way to me. You would have to ask somebody that that was there at the beginning and then after he eventually left, they'll give you a better answer than I would. Okay. Was Tupac, you know, he, you know, I think everybody knows he dissed, you know, Dr. Dre publicly a few times, man. Like, you know, like how mad was he at Dr. Dre? I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say Pac was mad at Dr. Dre. I think he was the point of like, damn, I just got here and, you know what I'm saying? Now he gone, you know what I mean? And, and you know, this is Dr. Dre, the, arguably the greatest hip hop producer of all times, you know what I mean? He's the sound of hip hop at that moment, the top of the motherfucking food chain. So I think Pac was more disappointed, you know what I'm saying? Like, damn, we could have made more California loves, you know what I mean? We could have, you know what I'm saying? Like. Their chemistry was already off the charts already. Would well, I love to see some more Dr. Dre and Tupac. <laughs> you and me man. both, man. You and me both. That would have been crazy, man. Uh, well, you know, a lot of people say, or, you know, there's been rumors about Tupac not being happy at death row. Mm. From your point of view, is there any truth to that? I think Tupac wasn't happy. Well, let me say it like this. To say he wasn't happy would be incorrect because he was very happy at what he had already accomplished at death row, how, you know, everything was turning out so far. You know, at that point in it, he knew it was time for him to grow. You know what I mean? And um, he wouldn't be able to be reach his fullest potential still being an artist signed to a label. Pac was already understanding that, yeah, it's time for me to sign myself. It's time for me to become the boss that I know I can be. You know what I'm saying? And that's where he was. And, you know, um, people like to say he was unhappy, woom, woom, woom. But I think you got to also understand that this is a guy that was maturing rapidly and growing. and. You know what I mean? New opportunities was coming his way, and he was just ready to explore those. So it was more like Tupac just recognized it was just, it's just a natural progression. You know what I'm saying? You're natural an artist, progression, yeah. You're going to want to be a boss. You know what I'm saying? You're going to want to be a boss at some point. You're going to want to own Absolutely. your own stuff. Absolutely, yeah. And from my perspective at that time, Suge was, in, was uh, supportive of that. I think Suge had mentioned that in some interviews mm -hmm. that he wanted to distribute Tupac's label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is something that I don't I don't think many people talk about, or maybe it's I think I might only talked about it maybe one other time on my channel. But Tupac had an extensive gun collection. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, what you? Yeah, he had a. He was a collector. Yeah. Okay. Do you know? Do you know what what kind of guns he had, or? I mean, all types, you know what I'm saying? Like, what era we talking about, you know what I mean? It was, you know, Pac was a collector, so, you know what I mean? You name it, he was going to get his hands on it. Like 20 guns, 30 guns, 40 guns? Oh, man, come on, dog. I never counted his guns. It was a lot. It was enough for each of us to have one. Okay. Okay. Tupac, you know, he gets to death row, and him and Snoop seem to have this, like, instant chemistry. You know, they make a, a hit, America's Most Wanted. And, I mean, you know what I'm Two saying? Two of America's Most Wanted. Oh, my bad. America's my bad. Most. That's Cube's record. That's Cube's record. Bro. Yeah. They make this hit, man, and it's it's a huge hit. Seems like they got this great chemistry, man. You know, uh, what was that time like? You it know, was when, great, when Snoop... man. It, it was this great scene, you know, two greats at the top of their game. You know, um, working working together, man, and they had a genuine bond and, 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 a, and a genuine love for each other. I see somewhere you guys used to hang out all the time. You guys used to hang out at Snoop's house. We we, we hung out a lot. Yeah, we we hung out, but not all the time. But yeah, we we definitely hung out. The camps was definitely, you know what I mean, connected and fucking with each other tough. Like the outlaws and the dog pound, we hung out more than you know we hung out with Pac and Snoop together. Like, we had our relationship with the pound that was a little bit more tighter than our relationship, per se, was with Snoop. Okay. And, you know, the the New York, New York video happens. Mm -hmm. And in New York, they're shooting the video. I mean, everybody kind of knows the story. 
and you know their trailer gets shot up and i believe you guys are over here on the west coast when this happens mm -hmm. and you know what was kind of like you know tupac's reaction when he found out this and he heard about everything yeah he was concerned man he was he was very concerned you know what i mean because he had been obviously shot in new york he knew how i can get out there you know what i mean new york ain't no motherfucking joke and so he was very concerned okay I mean, there, there was rumors that, you know what I'm saying, he was really like, you know, I don't know if he was screaming and yelling, but he was like, you know, really Pac mad. Pac can get emin em em animated, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At one point, you know, Snoop and everybody's in New York, I, I think they're doing a, uh, I don't know if they're doing a show, but Snoop goes on the radio station. Mm -hmm. And he starts talking about, you know, Biggie and, and saying a lot of positive things about Biggie. And I believe, uh, you know, Tupac is upset about this. You know, there's there's East and West. I don't know East and West, but, you know, Tupac has these issues with Biggie. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, were you around for that time? Yeah, you know, I was. I'm going to hit him up. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I meant, were you in New York when this happened? No, I didn't go to New York for that. That was for the MTV Awards that year. I didn't go for that. Okay. At what point, you know, Snoop and Tupac kind of have a falling out. You know, Snoop, come, I mean, uh, you know, everybody flies back on the plane. How's your guys' feelings and everything when when this fallout happens? Um, I can only speak for me, man. My, I was disappointed. You know what I mean? I was disappointed that, you know, we had to have this tension between, you know, two of the greatest artists at that time and the two leaders, you know, of, of death row, you know, artistically. So... I was disappointed. I was, you know, hoping hoping it could be worked out. You know what I mean? Whether whether them niggas had to get in the ring and, and, and you know, go a couple rounds or, you know, talk it out amicably. I just wanted, you know, them to work it out. You know what I mean? So it wasn't that tension that was that was going around for a little bit. You think they would have eventually worked it out? Hundred percent. Now, you know, Tupac comes home from prison and eventually he meets Kadada Jones. Mm -hmm. Were you around for that? For the meeting? When they met? No. Yeah. No. I think he actually had met Kadada prior to. Oh, they met. Going, going to prison. Years before. They, if so I'm not were... mistaken, yeah. I think they met prior to him going to prison. Oh, okay. Now, their story about meeting is, is kind of funny because didn't Tupac kind of diss Quincy Jones, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Early in his career. Early in his career, he mm -hmm. said some really nasty things about her. And I guess he approached Kadada not knowing that that was his No, it daughter? was her sister. It was her sister. People get that story mixed up. It was actually her, her sister. Okay. A and um, she, you know, she was like, yeah, you said some crazy shit about my pops. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And when did you notice Pac hanging out with Kadada? When did I notice it, man? I can't really pinpoint when I actually noticed it. I just know it went from him seeing a lot of different women to him just seeing Kadada. And then, you know, we kind of knew it was getting serious. So he actually started cutting women off for her. At least it from went your, from it went from, from your point of him view. seeing different women to him strictly seeing Kadada. As far as we know, you know what I'm saying? As far as I know, you know, at that point in time, once he got serious with Gadada, I didn't really, I didn't see any other women around him. And did she start coming around a lot more, I take it? Yeah. No, I think it's been, you know, widely reported, but, you know, the thing between Tupac and Biggie, we kind of touched on a little bit, man. You know, did you ever hang out with Tupac and Biggie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, could you know what what was that like? And you know where were you? If you I mean, we on records it. together, running from the police. We actually did that song together. You know what I'm saying? All in the studio that day. You know what I'm saying? Biggie was there, C's was there, a couple other members from Junior Mafia came uh, by the session, and so we had spent numerous, you know, numerous times around each other prior to everything becoming what it ended up becoming. Okay. Is there anything special about that session that you remember that, you know, Tupac and Biggie being on the same record together? That's uh, that's pretty crazy. Man, it's um, 
And it was I just remember a lot of people came through the session by the end of the night, man. A lot of hip hop greats came through. I, I'm like Dougie Fresh came through. I believe um, maybe uh, you know, of course, Stretch and a lot of those cats from Queens was there. Easy Mo B was there. You know what I mean? Um, Heavy D might have pulled up. It was just a lot of different people because Pac was in the studio working. Big was there. Big was definitely on his on his way up at that time. And so them two cats in the studio, the word started spreading around. Of course, we was in a, I think we was in a, God, what was the name of that studio in New York? I forget the name of it, but we was in the studio. A lot of artists worked at. So I just remember being a young dude, like, damn, I'm in a session. There's so many fucking hip hop greats up in here. This is, you know what I mean? This is dope. I believe you had a friendship with Little C's and, and Junior Mafia back then? Yeah, we was all cool, man. It was absolutely, you know, um, you know, the camps was cool, man. Like, Big was, wanted to be in Thug Life and, and Pac wanted him to be a part of Thug Life and, you know, wanted him on the album and, I think there was some clearance issues with uh with, with 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 Puff at the time. He didn't want Big putting too much material out before he started putting his shit out. So Pac couldn't get him on the album, but absolutely, man, it was it was it was all love. Biggie wanted to be in Thug Life. Okay, I don't. This is something I've never heard. I, I didn't. I did not know that. So this is so before Biggie blew up, they had this. You know. As everybody knows, they had this really, you know, pretty good friendship and relationship, man. And it was so tight that Biggie and Park, he was actually wanted to be part of Thug Life. That would have been crazy. Well, you got to understand that during this time, man, Puff situation was in limbo. You know what I mean? He had just left Uptown Records. He hadn't got that new deal yet, but he had Biggie as an artist. You know what I mean? And Big is, is you know, he's trying to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? He's not... B. I. he's not the notorious B.I.G. yet. He's still doing what he's doing. You know what I mean? He talked about it in his music, so you already know where I'm going with it. You know what I mean? Big was actually going in and out of town doing what he had to do to put food on the table. And so Pac is on. Pac is a major fucking star. Coming to New York, doing movies, doing press, you know what I mean? And he's hitting Big up, like, yo, come through. And he's like having Big come to the ward off of story. You know what I'm saying? Big is coming from Brooklyn. Big, Big ain't never even been in the ward off a story until, you know, he's coming to hang out with Tupac, who's a bona fide star. So it's not beyond the, re the realm of possibility or it's not hard to believe that he's looking at it like, yo, I don't know what's going on over here, but homie is rolling and he's fucking with me and I can get on. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, Big, I'm sure, was loyal to Puff and he wanted to wait. You know what I'm saying? And actually, Pac was one of the people that told him to wait. Like, nah, Puff gonna make you a star. I was a witness to that conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like, Pac, like, nah, chill. Puff will make you a star. You know what I mean? He know what he's doing. Just be patient. It's all gonna work out. You know, just being an encouraging energy for Big because he was, um, you know, feeling, feeling kind of desperate at that time and, 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 you know, obviously wanted to get on so he could put his stamp on the game. And that was on the time, you've heard these stories, Pac was letting him come, open up shows and shit. This is all around that same time. You mentioned uh, Tupac telling Biggie that Puffy will make him a star, man. That's kind of crazy to hear, you know what I'm saying, seeing how everything turned out. Mm -hmm. One thing about Pac, he wasn't a hater, you know what I'm saying? Pac wasn't a hater, like he wanted to see everybody win. He just wanted to win too. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, he really took Biggie kind of under his wing and, and, you know, did a lot for him, it seems like, you know, and and just to see everything go left with them. You know, how, how did you kind of feel when things started to kind of unravel and, you know, every everything started to happen when Tupac was accusing him of setting him up and everything? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that's incorrect, you know what I'm saying, in my opinion. I don't ever recall Pac saying Big set me up or Big had something to do with me getting shot. He did not say that. What was said was, you know, he felt like he could have got more support because, you know, you my man and, and this is your town. And so, you know, he felt at the time that he, he should have got more you know, support, respect, and loyalty from them.
So that was his main issue right there. Okay. Okay. Well, you guys do hit him up, mm -hmm. you know, which is iconic hip hop disc record, you know, my opinion, the best. Mm -hmm. And what was that? What was that like when you guys were making that? Well, for me, I come from the background of battle rapping, you know what I mean? And so that was strictly about, you know, being at our, at our, at our lyrical best and, you know, making an iconic disc record. And we talked about some of the great disc records before doing Hit Em Up that we wanted to, you know, not necessarily emulate, but be as great as, if not greater than. And, and those records are like, you know, the bridge is over and, you know, No Vaseline from Cube and, you know, some of the other really, really great battle records in hip hop. You know what I mean? We wanted to definitely be put on that list. Was there two versions of the song? It was. Okay. Well, so the what, one what the version that everybody eventually came to hear and know is actually the second version. It's the, it's the remix. And what was it like when he was recording that outro? Because the outro is crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's yeah. yelling, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. yeah. What were you guys thinking, like, watching him, you know? Well, for us, we had, you know, Pac was, was known for talking at the end of his records. You know what I mean? And so at the time, we weren't really that in tune to everything he was saying at the end of it. It was just another outro. You know what I mean? I just, me personally, I remember at the time, like, damn, this is a long outro. I know they're going to fade this out eventually. I was just thinking it was going to get faded out eventually because, you know, he would be, the recording process was his, just do the whole song and then, you know, kind of edit back a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Because we can't put out six, seven minute songs. But at that time, this is before Pro Tools and everything, this is when you had real, so you just you just did everything until the beat was over. At least that's how we recorded, you know what I mean? We recorded for the whole beat. Most of our records, you could hear vocals from beginning to end. And so it was just another outro to us. You know, you guys finished this record and I believe I've heard people say he played it for him. You know, what was people's reaction when he would play it for people? <laughs> most people was like, most people was, you know, you know, like, uh-oh, type shit. Were they like telling him not to put it out? Were they telling him to put it out or? Nah. Nah. Wasn't nobody telling Pac not to put it out. <laughs> nobody telling Pac shit. You know what I mean? That was an exercise in futility. He was already pretty clear on what he wanted to do. And Dr. J wanted to be part of the record. That's kind of But crazy. this is the original version that I'm talking about because the original one that we had did, Dre was still there. Eventually, a few months later, we went and did the remix that eventually came out on the uh, How Do You Want a Two of America's Most Wanted single, which was our official first single as the Outlaws. We did that after Dre left, that version that everybody hears today. So Dre had never heard that version. He had heard the original one, which was basically a freestyle. It was just all us just going in back to back, Wu-Tang style. Okay. And I see that you gave all your publishing to the estate for the song. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty dope, man. Yeah. How did all we you know? What was your motivation for doing that? And you know, what I'm saying, what was that? Well, we, the way we looked at it at the time was, you know, um, it was our way of giving back to not only Tupac but his mother, who was the head of his estate at that time, and who was trying to secure his copyright. Okay. And with us being on so many records, we tipped the scale in his favor. You know what I'm saying? If we did that, you know what I mean? And so eventually that led to the process of her getting his masters back and that whole process, you know what I mean? The Outlaws was actually the ones tipping the scale because we would give Tupac the majority of a song. Okay. I, I seen somewhere that Faith kind of tipped Biggie off about the song coming out. Well, that's what we believe, man, because, you know, when they came out with the Get Money remix, they had the same beat. And we had did, you know, our version that hit them up to that Don't Look Any Further sample. 
we had did it already. Pac had played it for Faith. And then, a, you know, a month or so later, we hear the Get Money remix. And it's, uh, oh, no, it's the, or was it the Players Anthem remix? It might have been a Players Anthem remix. That big sample don't look any further. I want to be, make sure I'm correct. So when we heard it, we was like, oh, shit. Faith probably said something and tipped him off and big, you know, we thought it was a shrewd move like, oh shit, you know what I mean? I, he came out with it first. But years later, I, I think I seen an interview with Caesar was like, nah, we had already did that. We had, we didn't know anything about Hit Him Up. Tupac, would he have played Hit Him Up for Faith? Absolutely. Really? Did, yeah. did he? Do you know, do you know that he I don't, did? I wasn't there if he did. I wasn't there. You know what I mean? I never was present when him and Faith interacted so i don't know if he played it for or not you know what i mean but i do know when we heard their version we was like yo faith must have said something so gotcha apparently it did happen would you so you so you didn't see faith at all in the studio or around tupac at all nah not at that time uh, -uh. we weren't at the studio at that time but there were other members you know what i'm saying like people like big shike you know what i'm saying it was around you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, this record comes out, man. It's uh, it's crazy. You know, it's huge. What was your guys' reaction, you know, when it came out and, you know, all the controversy and everything that it stirred up? Shit, we was like, let's go. You know what I mean? Because you got to understand at that point, we had been waiting in the wings, so to, so to speak, putting in our work as a collective, as a group, you know what I mean? Getting it right, putting it together, coming up with the right name, you know what I'm saying? Trying to really establish ourselves outside of Tupac. And so this was the record that was going to do that. It came out, the response was phenomenal. You know what I mean? Everybody on that record shined. So, you know, we was, we was excited, let's go, you know what I mean? But then it got banned and BET wouldn't show the video and radio stations wouldn't play it and, you know what I mean? But the streets was, you know, the streets was definitely lit up. Streets were definitely lit up. I remember. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. At least over here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Everybody was fucking with it, man. Um, I didn't know that the video got banned. You know, because I, I never seen the video till like years, you know, years later when it leaked on the internet. Yeah. You know. And you guys performed at the House of Blues. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, pretty a popular thing, man. What was that like? Shit, man, for me, it was, it's kind of a blur because I was sick as a dog that day. I had, I had like a summer flu. My temperature was like 102, 103, you know what I mean? And I really just wanted to go somewhere and lay down. And, you know, a um, couple of, the, you know, a couple of the women that was in the family and on our team was just, you know, making sure I drank a lot of tea and honey and lemon because... You know what I mean? I wasn't I wasn't gonna sit it out. It was the biggest show in LA at that moment. And so I was just like, I gotta fucking thug it out. Let me drink some Hennessy. <laughs> Let's go get it. What was the crowd like during it's that? It's insane. Night? Pandemonium. You know what I'm saying? It's Pac and Snoop at the height, you know what I'm saying, of their power at that time. You know what I'm saying? It's death row records. So it was pandemonium, sold out. No room in that motherfucker. It was like really, you know, epic. Yeah, for sure, for sure, man. Do you have any stories about the Calabasas house? Hanging out there? Um it's just it was it was a short period of time when he got that house, man. You know, my most of my memories from that uh period of time is just, you know, having a lot of family around and really seeing, you know, Tupac at his happiest I had seen him in a long time. He was very, you know what I'm saying, very happy about his life and the direction of it and where it was going. Okay. Uh, Napoleon said that there was a time when there was like a car parked outside and, uh, you know, you guys thought it was somebody trying to like trip or something and Tupac kind of ran out there. Is there anything yeah. like that that you yeah. remember? Can you Can you take me through it? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, I think I think some people had might have found out that he was living over there, some fans, and they was, you know what I mean, coming to, you know, do some sightseeing, and they picked the wrong house. Okay. I also seen that Tupac kind of, like, taught you guys how to move. What do you mean? 
like how to look out and you know what i'm saying like if someone comes in the house to you know what i'm saying like you could check check their hands and you know what i'm saying kind of like uh you know how, how to be safe i guess would be a good way to put it yeah yeah we had uh you know we had um our ways i guess so to speak certain things that we would do you know what i'm saying to vet people out and you know what i mean just you know kind of watch people whatever the case may be it was it was a few things. Can you talk about some of the things that Tupac taught you guys? Well, um, we definitely was on some other shit. Okay. We read a lot, man. We read a lot of books. Pac was a reader. I was a reader. You know what I mean? And, you know, we read all kind of books, all kind of shit. You know what I mean? How to make a bomb from bubble gum. Shit like that. Do you remember how or why Tupac came up with the nicknames that he came up with, like Machiavelli and, uh, you know, Napoleon and, and everybody? Yeah, absolutely. That was during a time where, you know, um, it was popular in hip-hop to change your name. You come up with aliases. A lot of different artists were doing it. Most notably, you know, Wu-Tang and Nas had Nas Escobar and Big was Frank White, you know what I mean? And for the most part, a lot of these... Uh, a lot of these pseudonyms and aliases were of people that were fictional characters. You know what I mean? Guys out of movies or, you know what I mean? Um, so Pac was like, yo, fuck that. We're going to snatch. We're going to take aliases from actual people and actual enemies of America because the young black male is, a ma is an enemy in his own country. And so we're going to use these names and throw it back in the power structure's face, you know, names like Hussein and Gaddafi and, you know, Idi Amin, the list goes on and on. And what was it like recording Machiavelli? Man, it was a short process, man. We did, we finished the, that album, the majority of it in three days. I think it only ended up being stretched out for the mixing process and the fact that Suge wanted to add, toss it up to it. But that album was pretty much done in three days. Three days, man. That's that's crazy, man. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen, uh, you know, video footage of Tupac saying, you know, we don't have the luxury and all this time and we got to just knock this out. We could just go in there right. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, what was it like kind of working with him and his worth ethic? Was it was it hard to keep up with Tupac? Not for us, you know what I mean? Not for us because, you know, you got to you gotta remember at the time we writing eight ball verses every now and then. We might get a 16 ball verse. That's not really hard to do, especially for us at that time. We was pretty used to the rhythm that, that he was on. Pac wasn't really a dude that liked to... Uh, sit and tinker with a song. He'd like for the producers to do that and then let him hear the finished product once it was done. And if he had any changes he wanted to make, he would let him know. But during the recording process, he wanted to get it out, get the, the basic structure of the song out, and then move on to the next one. I remember seeing an interview where Snoop said that when he was recording uh, Two of America's Most Wanted, that they was only going to give him one take to do the song. So he, that's why he took it home and he wanted to practice it because I guess, uh, you know, Tupac would just lay it down and, you know what I'm saying, one take and however it comes out, that's how it comes out, man. Is there, you know... Yeah, well, you know, Pac was pretty pretty fast in the studio, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, um, it didn't really take him a long time to get, it, to, get, to get a song done. It just really didn't. So I never heard that story before. That's the first time I'm hearing that story. You know, I wasn't there when they did Two of America's Most, the original version. I was there after, you know, once they came in and did, they did it for real. They did like a, a the first version, and then they did another version. Still the same, but, you know, it was a little bit more mixed and a little bit more polished. Okay. Well, I'm Machiavelli. You diss Exhibit. Mm -hmm. Over uh, and, and 
I mean, I, I think a lot of people were kind of surprised. I know I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it at the time when I first heard it, man. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was from the song Paparazzi, man, which was actually a song that we loved. It was dope. You know what I'm saying? We used to, Pac used to fucking ride around in this 500, 500 bands bumping that shit. You know what I mean? Almost on a daily because when it dropped, it was something new and fresh from the West Coast. It was a different sound. It wasn't G-Funk. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't our sound. And so, you know, Exhibit, Exhibit had came out with a whole new sound. And so, you know, just listen to it, bumping it, you know what I mean? Pac really loved the track, you know what I mean? And then one day, you know, it's just happening, either you're a rap, you're an actor, a rapper with it, or an actor, you know, was, Pac like rapper, actor, is he, is he talking about me? You know what I mean? Like, he's not talking about me, is he? You know, you know what? I think he is, you know what I mean? And so, it's like, yo, we gonna, uh, we gonna send a little shot at him, you know what I'm saying? And either you handle it, and so I just I took the you know the responsibility on that and put it in the, and put it in the verse. Did Tupac and Exhibit ever run into each other? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Not at that time. Uh huh. Okay. And you guys are cool. You guys are cool now. Absolutely. Years later. Absolutely, man. It's my guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know how how'd you guys you know uh, become cool and you know what I'm saying and all that. Well, we we. Through the years, we had ran into each other. In the beginning, when it was still kind of a little spicy, I ran into Exhibit um, after Tupac had passed, very shortly after Tupac had passed, and we came back to LA. And I ran into him at a party, and we had a chance to discuss it and what it was all about, you know what I mean? And I let him know where we was coming from on it, and he let it let us know under no circumstances was he sending a shot at Pac. It wasn't, it ain't, you know what I mean, had nothing to do with Pac. He actually fucked with Pac and fucked with Pac's music. And so, you know what I mean, it was squashed a long time ago. And then eventually we started doing music together. We ended up on a couple of songs together, you know, um, and then we just put out the One Nation song most recently together. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. For years we've heard about this Angie Martinez interview. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all this controversial stuff Tupac was uh, supposed to have said in this interview and, you know, kind of everybody that he kind of dissed on records that he had a lot to say about during this interview. Uh, were you around for that interview? Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of it? I know it was a long time ago and it was an interview. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I don't remember a lot of the specifics, man. I just, I, I remember he was very anxious to you know, make sure people understood where he was coming from amidst all the controversy and everything that was going on at the time. And so <clears throat> I believe that was truly his purpose for doing that interview was just to kind of set the record straight. People can understand where he was coming from. Was that like from um, a point of view that everybody thought he was like dissing New York as a whole? Because I, I think a lot of people thought that. Yeah, and then who better to talk to about it than you know, the, the, the queen of radio? at that time of New York radio, specifically. Do you remember anything he said about any of the people, like Dr. Dre? Nah, I don't really remember specifics, man. It was a long time ago. Smoked a lot of weed over the years, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was Tupac disappointed that it didn't come out? Um, I don't remember him. I don't remember him either voicing an opinion either way about that at the time. Okay. Would it have been real controversial had it came out, as she actually played it? Would it have been like... Well, I mean, she's... she's Didn't she drop, like, snippets? And a couple little snippets. Those snippets have been pretty, you know what I mean, pretty, pretty controversial in and of itself. So I'm sure the whole interview would have definitely been, you know, an eye-opener. I see it somewhere that in the middle of the interview, the Tupac gave her a gun to hold because she felt nervous to make her feel better. They I, don't remember, that. I don't remember. I, I don't remember none of that. I don't even think Tupac would do something like that. You know what I mean? Okay. I didn't think so either, but... Nah. Yeah. Nah. What was it like, you know, after Tupac passed away, being on death row? Man, it was slim pickings, man. It was rough, man, because, you know, the CEO of the company was incarcerated. Um, it was it was a couple of different people who had assumed the position of of leadership over there at the time, and so it was never really one focus. You know, Suge was still 
doing the best that he could from inside the walls of, um, you know, steering the ship. But obviously it wasn't running, you know, at optimal strength like it would have been if he would have been home and able to, you know, run it like he saw fit. So it was, you know, we was languishing, man. We was like the song, Stranded on Death Row. Jay Prince had came out and said that he wanted to sign Tupac when Tupac was in prison. You know, have you heard that before? I heard I heard something to the effect that he said that, you know, he, he, w he wished we'd had the opportunity to have Tupac on his label. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if he acti actively wanted to sign Tupac or not. You know, he was kind of already in record deals, so. Okay. That would have been a little difficult. And you guys eventually signed to Jay Prince? No. No, you guys never signed to him? Okay. Not not a record deal, not officially. We did a publishing deal with Jay Prince. Jay Prince actually threw us a lifeline at a time where we was, you know, struggling. And we was really trying to figure it out and, you know, trying to see if we was either 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 even going to stay in this rap shit. And um, through, through uh, Yuck Mouth from the Loonies, uh, that connection came about. And Jay Prince, through the kindness of his heart, man, you know, did a six-figure publishing deal with us to, you know, write some songs for different artists and, you know, come up with some stuff for different people on the label. And um, that was just a way of him, you know, I felt like looking out from the kindness of his heart, but also as a businessman, you know, he saw a future with us as well. So he was like, until we can work out the particulars, I'm gonna shoot y'all something for some work. You know what I mean? Because I see y'all, you know what I mean? Y'all stomachs is, y'all ribs is touching out here. Okay, uh, that's what's up. Yeah, yeah, forever grateful for that. Was it hard getting off death row when you guys had to leave? When you say hard, what do you mean? Was it hard to get shook to let you guys go? Hell yeah, it was a process, man. You know what I'm saying? It was a process that, uh, you know, um, unfortunately we had to take. You know what I mean? We had to go the legal route. And we wanted to be on death row. Obviously, we went back to California after Pop passed away and signed a recording contract with the label. But it wasn't being ran right. You know what I mean? We was just kind of languishing and, and, and not being able to, you know, make a living because we would want to do features with artists and a lot of times they wouldn't sign off on the features, you know what I mean? We had, you know, records with that, in my opinion, could have, you know, established us, reestablished us, and those records weren't able to see the light of day. Mm. And so we had to make a move. Okay. One thing I don't really hear too many people talk about is that uh, Tupac actually had a relationship with Monster Cody. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, can you kind of talk about that a little bit, or, you know what I'm saying, or is there... I just you remember know Monster it? Cody, you know, um, at the time, we, we had all read his book, you know what I'm saying? It was it was, it was, was kind of required reading. Um, great book, by the way. And, uh, you know, Pac and Monster would, would talk periodically on the phone. I remember him calling from jail a couple times. You know what I mean? Chopping it up with Pac. We actually spoke to him a couple times as well. Did you hear the leaked phone conversation between I have. Them? I have heard that before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was kind of crazy when that leaked. I was, I was like, yeah. damn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, where did that come from? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Did they have any plans of working together or doing anything? I think Pac wanted to turn Monster's book into a movie at one point. Yeah, I think he wanted to get behind uh, a possible movie. And Tupac would have played the book. Monster the Cody? Book. Um, I don't know if he was he was talking about playing Monster Cody, but it's, it's possible. You know what I mean? Being that he was a fucking actor, a pretty good one. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been a crazy movie. Yeah. 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 Still could be, you know what I mean? Crazy movie, especially, you know, the way things, you know, turned out for the both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, man. One of the people Tupac dissed on the Machiavelli album was Jay-Z. What was his feelings about Jay-Z or, you know what I'm saying, was it just because he was close with Biggie? You know, I mean, those were the rumors that we heard as well. It, really, it really it really, just had more to do with that, their affiliation and the fact that, you know, it was a green light 
on big and so you know at that time it was just been a green light on anybody standing next to him you know and when i say green light i just mean on some rap shit do you think tupac and biggie would have eventually talked it out or or you know what i'm saying like squash the beef and you know what i'm saying what do you think would have happened I, 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 you know, I can't predict the future or, you know, I don't want to allude to what could have happened, but I will say this. After um, Tupac came back from New York, he kind of wanted to, you know, leave, uh, uh, especially with the One Nation project. He has started to um, want to put a lot of that shit to bed, like, all right, I'm over it. And so I think there could have been a pathway to reconciliation between them two because Pac was, you know. And I don't think Big ever really was on it like that at all anyway. And so Pac was, you know, kind of over it towards the end. Were you guys surprised that Biggie never really responded with a diss record? Surprised? Not really. Not really, you know what I mean? Because, um, I just, I just, nah, we wasn't surprised that he didn't come back with another record you know what I mean I don't I don't think any of us even is, expected you know what I mean another record a, a, a response to hit him up were you around when Biggie dropped Who Shot Ya? yeah yeah was Tupac's feelings like you know that was about me um I think you know at the very least he felt like it was bad timing mm to okay. release a record like that, especially with, you know, the media and the streets and everybody, you know, so tuned in to his ordeal in New York, getting shot, robbed at Quad Studios, and then this record leaks shortly thereafter. It's bad timing. Mm, okay. With the Machiavelli album, I heard that Park wanted Machiavelli, he originally wanted it to be a mixtape, Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that? Because mm -hmm. at that point, mixtapes weren't really that big. Mm -mm. Maybe just in like New York and everything. And do you know why it didn't make it as a mixtape or or what happened? Yeah, I don't think Suge was, you know, Suge wasn't with, you know, just giving away free shit. <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah. And then they had that whole contract thing. You know what I'm saying? And so Pac still owed him some music. And so, you know, Suge was like, look, let's just, you know, put it out as a project, an official project. Nas, from what I understand, anyway, Nas, the Nas disc part was supposed to be taken off the record. Mm-hmm. You know, he already released one one big album that year, you know what I'm saying? I, I remember when Machiavelli came out, it was kind of, you didn't really get like more than one album in a year from an artist, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and this, this album dropped, you know, uh, two months after he passed away, man. You know, what was your kind of thoughts about how fast it came out? And, you know what I'm saying, were you guys surprised that the Nas disc was still on there? Well, no, we wasn't surprised that the Nas disc was still on there because Pac wasn't able to take it off himself, and that was the only way that was going to happen. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so we wasn't surprised. We knew it wasn't, it wasn't going to be removed, or it didn't get removed because Pac wasn't able to do it himself how did the whole thing with nas start and do you know what made him diss nas on the record fake thug no love what song is that it's on a nas it's, album it's on nas's album um it's on the, the the same album he had that uh the song with lauren hill yeah, and, uh, yeah. Street Dreams. And so there's some bars in there. I think when Nas talk about getting shot and coming out the hospital the same day, there's some bars in there that, you know, pique Pac's interest. During this time, Pac was dissing a lot of people. Were you guys surprised or what was your guys' kind of feelings about everything that was going on? And You know what I'm saying? I the mean, from my perspective, man, it was really just, you know, that was the head of the snake. You know what I mean? So to speak, for lack of a better a a a analogy, you know what I'm saying? Pac was the leader. Pac was, you know, um, not only that, he was our benefactor. He was our brother. He was our, you know what I'm saying, our family member. So 
it didn't really matter who it was. We was we was with the bullshit, no matter who it was at that time. Was Tupac a real competitive person? Oh yeah, yeah. We were all competitive, man. You gotta you gotta look at it like a fucking basketball team with a bunch of alphas. You know what I mean? We were all competitive. We were all hungry. You know what I'm saying? We all were hunger hunger for not only, you know, to change our lives and change our family's lives, but for respect and for our spot in the game. And Tupac was still this hungry even after all this success and everything. Because he yeah. seemed like when he came out of prison, he was just going. Like, he was just, you know, recording. He was just, just smashing. Yeah, he was in a maximum security prison for the better part of a year. You know what I'm saying? After being, you know, on um, top of the world in movie screens and platinum selling artists. And so that happens, you kind of got to, you know, you kind of starting over. He was literally starting over. So all eyes on me, you can, you can, you can almost say that's a new artist. That energy is the same energy that new artists come into the game with. Mm, so he kind of felt, so he was kind of, kind of starting over. He didn't really, he came out of prison. He didn't really have anything. He had his, his career. You know what I'm saying? He had the, the work that he had put in up until that point, and that's it. How did going to prison affect him? What do you mean, like? Like, did it change him at all? Yeah, prison will change you. Prison will change you, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It'll harden you, you know what I'm saying? It's either gonna break you or make you, and it didn't break him. Was he less trustworthy of women? I wouldn't say he was less trustworthy of women. I think he just knew, he just learned a new way to operate when dealing with women. And, you know, the fact that women can become extremely intoxicated by fame and power and money and will go to certain levels to, you know, share space with you. And so you kind of got to make sure you're not as um, accessible to certain type of, you know, individuals, male or female, but most specifically, you know, women, the groupies. You know what I'm saying? Them, them kind of women that, you know, a week ago before you was famous and popping, they wouldn't even look at you twice. But now that you're on a big screen, you have money, you have fame, they just can't uh, seem to understand why they can't have you. You know what I'm saying? It, so he just learned the valuable lesson. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Why did Tupac want to be on a cross on the Machiavelli album cover? That's a great question, man. I, I, I think, you know, Machiavelli, from the music, it had some religious undertones, had some very deep concepts on it, and... um you know, I feel like, you know, quite possibly, this is not something that he verbalized to any of us or to me personally, but I feel like he could have felt like he was, you know, um, sacrificing himself, so to speak, for hip hop and for the, for the, uh, not just the West Coast, but for the underdog, the one that, is looked over the one that people scoff at because they don't necessarily come into the game all shiny and looking like a million bucks you know what i'm saying for the have-nots for the rose roses that grow from concrete pop felt like he was the torchbearer for those for those people in my opinion was it surprising to see him on the album cover like that. Did you guys know it was coming or, or would you guys just yeah, see it like yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, it was his concept. You know oh, what okay. I mean? Yeah, it was his concept. And he gave the, the concept to the artist, Risky, who eventually ended up doing that cover and did a great job on it. It's an iconic cover. You know what I mean? I think I seen one list that said it was, you know, top five album covers of all time. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, but you know, uh, we weren't surprised, you know what I mean? Because we was like sitting right there when he was saying this is what he wanted the album cover to be. 
with well, all eyes on me movie came out not too long ago man uh what was your thoughts on that um my my thoughts initially was it was about time you know what i'm saying i felt like Pac deserved a biopic on you know his uh his times and you know what i'm saying so i was happy that it was able to you know finally get done okay do you feel like it was a good movie? Do you feel like it could have been better? I felt like All Eyes on Me, you know, uh, suffered from not being able to have Tupac Shakur actually playing himself. Mm, okay. Because to me, that's all people really wanted. And so I kind of felt like at the beginning that movie didn't stand a chance no matter how good it was. Because nothing was going to give people what they wanted, and that's Pac back. Yeah. Were all the rumors and everything kind of driving you guys crazy after he passed away? After he passed away? Yeah. The rumors, what, what kind of rumors? Like the him being alive rumors and everything? Um, It was just, you know, it was just ironic to, to see people really believe that... um. You know, he could actually, you know, fake his own death or, you know what I mean, be somewhere in Cuba hiding out. Like, what the fuck would he be hiding from? You know what I'm saying? And, like, you know, um, Pac being the kind of individual that he was, just being able to stay quiet <laughs> for all these years and shit like that. So we kind of got a laugh out of it. It's one of the things that we could laugh out of that horrific situation so you guys didn't take it too serious you guys didn't nah nah i remember hearing a lot and i mean you know i remember just crazy rumors man it was it was crazy man. yeah a whole lot a whole lot of like, crazy he, shit he's like uh you know he's like elvis you know yeah and them rumors still pop up every now and then they they still to this day 20 plus years later people still there'll be a pox sighting or somebody will say come up with another theory and you know what I mean? It'll it'll run hot for a minute, and then it'll die down. Right. Some picture. Yeah. Some yeah. unseen picture. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Those shoes didn't come out till yeah. after Park. It was either away. another rapper, some rapper. I think from the group Jurassic Five, that people had. I think his name is a kill, and this actual people that believe he's Pop. You know what I'm saying? And Pop just, I guess, didn't want to be Tupac no more, and decided to be. This, this guy from the group Jurassic 5. You can go on YouTube right now and look it up. And people will actually break it down and say, you know, because they look, I guess in their eyes, they look alike and, you know what I mean? But he has he has locks and shit. And, you know, people actually believe that this guy is, <laughs> is Pac. Yeah, yeah, true story. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. How do you feel about you know, all the artists that might call themselves the next Tupac or, you know, or people saying like, oh, this artist is, you know, he's the Tupac of this era. Yeah, I mean, you know, I understand why they do it. I understand that, you know, Pac is probably argue, is arguably the, 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 the greatest marketing, you know what I'm saying? Self-marketing of an artist ever. And when I say that, I mean, Pac wasn't created by some A&R or some record exec that said, yo, you should wear that and get a tattoo here. You know what I'm saying? And do your vocals. A lot of times these artists just come, they can rap, but they don't have no vision for how to present themselves to the world. And so you have an artist like Pac, who's completely self-made from top to bottom. Nobody came up with that. Nobody designed that. That was him doing that, you know what I'm saying? The reason why he was chiseled and cut is because he did hundreds of push-ups every day on purpose. So when he took off that shirt, I'm chiseled, I'm cut, you know what I'm saying? You, you know what I mean? So everything you see about a Tupac Shakur is created, self-made. These other artists don't have that capability, but Pac ain't here and that looks good, man. That, he did that Pac shit, he did that well. I could just be a little bit of that, and if I could just get a little bit of that love that he gets, 
I'm set. I'm straight. You know what I mean? And so it's a lot of that. It's also the influence. You know what I mean? Pac is a highly inf influential hip hop figure in the, in the history of hip hop. And so his influence, especially if you are a young dude, when he was at the, the height, is undeniable. And so some of these people are just naturally influenced. You know what I'm saying? Like I brought up, you know, Jordan and the Kobe phenomenon. You know what I'm saying? Like we all know. I, I'm loving you got that Lakers jersey on. You a Laker fan? Oh, yeah. Okay, then we family. Good, good, good. <laughs> and so, shout out, rest in peace, Mamba. This is three-year anniversary. I got to say that, but just like, you know, there was a Jordan and then Kobe came along and everybody's like, oh, he's biting on Jordan's moves and all of that. Well, he was clearly influenced by Jordan, but he was able to bring his own, you know, greatness to the table. You know, how do you feel about, like, you know, people, they, they diss him or, you know, I think, you know, years after, you know, he passed away, Funkmaster Flex went on a whole rant about him. You know, how, how do you feel like when you see something like that? A lot of times it's clickbait, man, because cats know if they say Pac's name, if they talk about Tupac, if they, you know, just saying his name going to get you likes. Just being able to put in the heading, Funkmaster Flex says this about Tupac, it's going to absolutely get views and looks and likes and all of that type of shit and um you know i see somewhere that you had problems getting on the radio in new york or something oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we pretty much was black lit, black ball from new york radio mm, that's kind of crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you had, like, one of the best publicists or the best publicists or something? And we had a pretty good publicist, man. We had a pretty good publicist that couldn't get us on any major New York radio station. How did you guys feel when that was going I on? I mean, it, it fucking sucked, especially because we all grew up listening to New York radio. You, you got to understand, we on East Coast. Our origins started on the East Coast, you know what I'm saying? And... We grew up influenced by the great DJs on New York radio, like Red Alert, you know what I'm saying? And so on and so forth, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it sucked, man. But shout out to people like the late, great K Slate, who embraced us and seen us going through what we was going through and embraced us. And, you know, K Slate didn't really listen to nobody. So we eventually made it to New York radio here and there because Slay would play, you know, some of our records and some of the records we did for him. You know what I mean? And so I'm forever eternally grateful to, to, the, to the Drama King. A lot of y'all kids listening to that Drake song, and he's shouting out the Drama King. That's who you're talking about. The late, great K. Slay, who, in, in my opinion, was one of the greatest DJs and influences of the culture in New York City. Mm. Yeah, definitely, man. Rest in peace, K. Slay, man. Uh, 100%. You know, definitely. That was a great loss legend. to hip-hop. Yeah. Because he was one of one. Definitely, definitely. What was your guys' relationship like with Suge? Um, you gotta understand, man, like Pac and Suge was tight, and we was Pac little homies. Suge had his own other little his own little homies. Suge little homies and us became tight. But our relationship with Suge wasn't like Pac and Suge's relationship. It was more along the line of on some you know, big brother, big homie type shit. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but it was it was always, always you know, love and, and and respect for everything that he did and accomplished. I mean, they say that Suge and, and Tupac just clicked. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What what was you know what I'm saying? Seeing them hang out, you know, they say that it seemed like they knew each other forever. Yeah, man, they had a they had a you know, a, a very Good working relationship, man, especially because, um, like I said, Pac, you know, appreciated what Suge did. He put his, you know, he put his neck on the line and, and you know, um, the whole death row as a family embraced Tupac and embraced us and, you know, genu genuinely wanted to see Pac win. And so their relationship was, you know, tight. You know what I'm saying? They had a lot of good times together. Some of them shits we wasn't witness to because they would get together and do their own thing. You know what I'm saying? And we were still kind of young. You know what I'm saying? So we couldn't always hang out with them, you know, as much as as much as they did. But they always just seemed to be having like the most fun. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've seen videos of them. Yeah. Laughing, always laughing, joking. always jovial, you know what I mean? Always cracking jokes on each other, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, yeah. Okay. It was dope to see them together. You guys released the album, Still I Rise. Mm hmm How much of that album was finished before uh Pretty podcast? much none of it. It was in pieces. You know what I'm saying? We were starting on the process of doing our album and we were creating songs and we would just work. And so our process pretty much was we would do a bunch of, we would create a bunch of shit and then go back and listen to it and Pac would be like, okay, I'm gonna keep that for my shit. That's for y'all shit. I'm gonna keep that for my shit. That's for y'all shit. And so, you know, we still, it was in bits and pieces. Some songs needed another verse. Some songs needed a hook. Some songs needed to be mixed. Some songs needed to be remixed. But we eventually did that when it came time to put that project, to get, project together. Okay, you guys put this album together. Dope album. And it doesn't, does it not get the proper promotion or marketing behind it when it comes out? Well, we was about to. It was about, a lot of that was about to happen. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, we put the first single out, which was Baby Don't Cry. That that did pretty good for us at radio. Um, it's the number one single in a couple, couple different countries. And uh, we were on our way. And then it got time to do the second single, and we had some, uh, some, some pretty high-profile interviews coming up and stuff like that. And midway through, Death Row and Interscope couldn't get on the same page about some things and next thing I know, it's like we're done with that. No more singles, no more promotion. Man. On to the next. Damn. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I remember a lot of people were kind of, I, I don't know, at least from a fan's perspective, you know, when people were remaking the Tupac songs and the Tupac albums, you know, they used a lot of uh, new beats. They would redo the beats to kind of make it current. But they never went back and got any of the original producers that produced the track. That's not true. That's not true. Mm -mm, okay. No. Mm -mm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um. Yeah, I'm. you know, we, we, we pretty much worked predominantly with the new producers. And if we didn't work with the new producers, it was because they used a sample that needed to be removed. So, and you gotta also remember that Johnny J did a lot of these unreleased songs and Johnny J actually signed off on some of the remixes and then, you know, he, he would either do them himself or he signed off on some of them. Uh, so, it was business. It wasn't really about making the beats current. It was because a lot of, we sampled a lot and those samples were eating up a lot of the publishing. Mm, okay, I see. Can you kind of, uh, you know, break down your relationship with all the other outlaws and, you know what I'm saying, it, you know, kind of how everybody came together and everything, you know, and uh, I just thought we'd, we'd probably start with Fatal, rest in peace. Yeah, Fatal and Gaddafi were real tight from very young age. And so, you know, Gaddafi was always telling Pac about Fatal. Like, yo, he's the best rapper in Jersey. He's the, you know, he's the best rapper yeah, yeah, in Jersey. It's, you know, and eventually Gaddafi was successful in bringing him to the table. Okay. Uh, what, at one point he left the group, right? Because I remember he had a solo album. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You know, do you know why he left the group or what happened? Well, what happened really was, you know, after Pac died, him and Gaddafi went back to Jersey. The rest of us went to Atlanta. And so we had always, you know, talked about bringing it back together, but we wanted to bring it back together on the West Coast and come back out here to death row. And Fader wasn't really, you know, too crazy about Cali after, after Pac passed, you know what I'm saying? And so he wasn't with that shit. You know what I'm saying? And he decided to um, to go do a deal, do a solo deal, and, and didn't want to sign to Death Row. And we did. Okay, uh, Gaddafi passed away, you know, a few months after Tupac, man. You know, what was your relationship like with him, and, you know, how did you guys meet? Yeah, just family. You know what I mean? Tupac, Gaddafi, and Castro, we all knew each other from a very young age. Okay. Castro. You mentioned Castro. 
Mm -hmm. Same thing. You guys knew each other from a young age. You know, what was your guys' relationship like? You know what I'm saying? Is there any stories from any, any guys brothers, you could share? Man. Brothers, man. Just, you know what I'm saying? Like a real brotherhood, you know, just all trying to figure it, figure it out. You know, our, our relationship was similar to like that movie, The Outsiders, man. You know what I'm saying? Just some young kids just trying to figure life out. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and uh, wanting to change our lives and the lives of our families is the best way we knew how. And we picked hip hop as a vehicle to do that. Okay. And I think I've seen somewhere he, he was never really into rap. Castro? Yeah. I mean, nah, nah he, was, he was into rap. He wasn't really into being an artist. That wasn't, that wasn't his dream. You know what I mean? That wasn't him or Gaddafi's dream. The, the rap shit was more me and Pac's dream. You know what I'm saying? They was just kind of like there for the ride and kind of started taking it serious once they saw it could actually be something for real. Like it could actually happen. And, you know, watching Pac, you know, get to a level that he got to, it made it believable for the rest of us. Mm, okay. How's he doing today? Castro's great. Okay. Doing really good. Yep. Do you still keep in contact with everybody? Yeah, absolutely. We all see each other, know each other, you know what I mean? But we're all grown and we have lives, so it's not like back in the days when we all kicking it every day, you know what I'm saying? Definitely not like that no more. And Napoleon. Mm hmm You know, how how'd every how'd you meet Napoleon and everything? Yeah, Napoleon came to the group, man, because he knew Gaddafi as well from Jersey. You know what I mean? Gaddafi is kind of responsible for all the Jersey guys getting to the group from Napoleon to Fado, the young noble. That connection comes through Gaddafi. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one member who seems to lay low and nobody ever hears from is Storm. Mm -hmm. You know, how did she come into the group? And, you know, is there anything you could share about her? Well, at the time, I think um, Storm was uh, an artist around Death Row. You know, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to be incorrect about this because, you know, people get real sensitive about shit. But I think she was kind of like more, you know, down with the dog pound. She was kind of like, you know, I remember first hearing her and she kind of sounded like a female Snoop to me. You know what I'm saying? She kind of had that laid back kind of flow. You know what I'm saying? And then her style got a little bit more aggressive when she, she got with Pac and us. But at the time, I just remember her being an artist around Death Row and, you know, working with some producers, trying to get her career off the ground. I don't know if she was signed yet, but I believe she had interest. You know what I'm saying? People were interested in her as an artist. And Pac was looking for a female to put down with the click. You know what I'm saying? And, and um, you know what I'm saying? It was like, well, we got Storm. Check her out type shit. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think there would have been more outlaws added to the group as time went on? Um, or was there anybody else that was possibly being talked about? You know, after Noble, there were there were there were you know affiliates. Noble. Yes, Noble. Noble was the last official outlaw that was handpicked by Tupac himself. You know what I'm saying? After that, Pac was pretty you know good with as far as adding new members to the group. But of course, we had people that we was cool with and other affiliates that. You know what I'm saying? That we fucked with. But as far as the group, the, the, the members of the group was pretty much set in stone after no. What was the plan for the group? Were you guys going to do like a group project and then everybody was going to go solo or? You know? Well, the, the Outlaws consisted of a solo artist, which was Young Noble, then two groups, Fatal and Felony and Dramacidal. And so, you know, I don't really know if we would have eventually branched off and did solo shit or not. That was definitely a possibility. But at the time, we was just focused on getting the outlaws established and getting that off the ground. Okay. At one point, you guys actually, you know, you guys, then we kind of touched on it a little bit with, uh, you know, being cool with little C's and, you know, uh, kind of ending the beef and everything, you know. Can you kind of talk about how that happened and how you guys linked up and everything? Um... The the low C's and, and 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 Noble started to communicate, and and that's how it's, it, the process started. And again, the late great K Slay was largely, uh, in, you know, part of that process. Was it 
surprising for you guys or like I don't want to say surprising man but you know you guys kind of didn't squash it for so long you know and then you guys kind of came together you did music man you know how did you feel or you know what I'm saying what was that kind of process like where you guys you know what I'm saying was you know was it like you know this has just gone on long enough well for me personally man I'm just speaking for myself once Pac and Big both lost their life the shit was over to me right then and there it was you know this shit had went way too far you know what i mean um we lost two of the greatest arguably the greatest hip-hop artists of a generation it was just a bad look for hip-hop it was a bad look for the culture and so you know i, I didn't want to be a part of anything that prolonged any more of that type of negativity and and you know what i'm saying shit that wasn't productive and just didn't want to have no more of that so the shit was the shit was over already already you okay. know what i'm saying and i guess all, all all that needed to happen was a conversation what was it like getting together that first time working with them man it was it was dope man it was it was dope and it was positive man and it felt like the right thing to do you know what I'm saying? And the song we eventually ended up doing was called Bury the Hatchet. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, it just felt like it was the right thing to do. And, you know, if, you, if you've if you ever had a chance to be around C's, it's hard not to like him. He's a, he's a, he's a, a good fucking dude. You know what I mean? Always smiling. Always got something positive to say. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's like, yeah. That shit is over, you know what I'm saying? That's that's my brother right there, you know what I mean? I love him. I want to see him, you know, do well. I want to see him heal from losing his homie, just like I want to heal from losing my homie. Yeah, that's what's up. Mm -hmm. That's what's up, man. Gobi was following Tupac around for quite a while with the cam video camera. Nah, not, not quite a while. We was going to, we was... Pac was a little bit ahead of the curve on as far as wanting to do something that was reality based. And so he had this idea of a day in the life of, you know, Tupac and the Outlaws and, you know, there's a little bit of footage of that running around at the beginning of it where, you know, we was just going to have cameras just, you know, get our day to day. Because our life, you know, outside of, you know, um, you know, outside of what everybody or seen or heard about Pac or whatever was was involved a lot of fucking laughs and, you know, good times and shit. So Pac was like, yeah, I think we should capture this shit. I don't really know what his plans were for it, but, yeah, you know, we were starting to do some filming. Uh, I mean, I heard that it was like the last week. Is that... Nah, it was a little bit. A little, a little bit, bit before? before that, yeah. Okay, I mean, how much footage do you, he has? Do you think he has a lot of like a lot of footage or quite a bit? Are you not? Do you know how far they were along with the project? <sighs> from from what I can remember, bro, we had just really started that shit, and so it wasn't it wasn't a whole lot. Mm. Yeah. Okay. There's always been rumors that Tupac got a lot a lot of death threats, you know, and he kind of put a lot of stuff in his music and everything. Man, is there anything? you know, that you could talk about or, you know, that you've seen during those times? Um, you know, Pac had, had, had br brushes and run-ins with, with, you know, death a few times prior to him actually, you know, leaving his planet. And so, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was, a, it was a few times, you know what I mean? I wasn't always there for it, but you would hear about stuff, you know what I mean? You would hear, you know, rumors and shit, chit chatter. Yeah. What was kind of like, you know, your feelings towards that, or you know what I'm saying? How, what would you feel when you would hear something like that? I mean, I, I felt the same way anybody would feel if they loved one is in, is in possible danger. You know what I'm saying? You want to um, do your best to, to to protect them. You wanna you wanna make sure anybody who has plans to, you know, bring him any harm are are fa failures at it and they, they're not successful in any kind of motherfucking way. So, you know what I mean? 
I felt like anybody else would feel like, yeah, okay, that's what y'all want to do. It's going to be a problem. Did you guys feel like uh, Biggie was dissing Tupac on his album? Which one? Uh, the double CD. Um, I mean, at the time, was we, was so, we was so anti everything that way. I, I never even heard Life of Death in its entirety. You know what I mean? So I just heard different rumors and, you know what I'm saying? Or other fans would tell us like, yo, you know, Pac, Big, I think Big was talking about Pac on a song. I think he had a song called, you're nobody, that somebody kills you. And then years later, I heard he might have been talking about Nas. And then Big had another song called Niggas Bleed. And, you know what I'm saying? What's beef? And, you know, these different songs, you know, the rumor mill would start up and say, you know, he's sending bars at... At, at Pac, but because he never actually said Pac's name, you know what I mean? We really didn't give it too much energy. Mm, okay. Would you be surprised about like how many of the fans were just like ready to just, you know, go all out for Tupac? You know? Would I be surprised? Yeah, were you surprised no. about the love? I mean, the good man, you know, to, you know, it was my era of music, you know what I'm saying? The Death Row era was like my era of music, man. And people really like, you know, fucked with Pac in a deep way more than like other artists. Mm -hmm. Nah, I'm not, I wasn't surprised at that, man, because Pac bared his soul in his music. You know what I mean? He gave you literally pieces of him through his music. And so when an artist does that, it's going to endear his audience to him. You know what I mean? Most artists give you one perspective of them. They only give you one view. And that's usually their best side. You know what I'm saying? Like someone's like, only get my left side. Artists don't want to really show you everything. Pac was rare in that regard. You know what I mean? He's more in the line of a Marvin Gaye and Bob Marley and you know what I'm saying? Artists that actually bear their fucking soul on a, on, on on record for you. You know, and so it gets it gets, you know, embedded in your brain and in your psyche. You know what I mean? You be, it, it becomes like a relationship almost. You become like you know this person. You know what I'm saying? Even though you've never met him before, most of the people that I talk to that are major Pac fans always say the same thing. Like, I felt like I knew him. You know what I mean? I felt like I actually knew that dude. That's because of what he gave you in his music and the, how deep he was willing to go. Mm. For your listening pleasure. Where do you think that came from? Like, I just think that's who he was. You know what I'm saying? I just think that's who the, the kind of individual Tupac was. And because he was that kind of individual, his music was going to reflect that. Mm, okay. Did he ever talk to you about concepts for songs or anything like that? Like before? Yeah, recording? we would always talk about all, we would talk about all kind of shit. You know what I mean? We would have long, really in-depth, deep conversations about life and about manhood and about what it takes to survive in this world. And a lot of those conversations would eventually turn into songs. Mm, okay. Were you there when Tupac did the show in Chicago where he had the issues? Where he got mad at the crowd over uh, Yummy Sandoval? I think I, I think yeah, I that was a long time ago. I think, I don't, I don't know if it was in Chicago. I think it might have been in Milwaukee. But it was definitely around that time of the young, Yummy Sandifer okay. can situation. You, can you kind of talk about what happened or take me through it? Well, yeah. Um, it was a tragic situation where this kid was murdered. You know, he had days prior to him being murdered and his body being found. He was like on a, on a rampage. You know what I mean? I think he had shot a couple people, even might have killed some people. And um, the hood he was from, the gang he was from or whatever, they felt like he was bringing too much attention to, uh, to them from law enforcement. So he was eventually murdered. He was a young kid. I think he was like 12, 13 years old. I'm not really sure how old he was, but he was very young. And it affected Pac. You know what I'm saying? Pac took it very hard. You know what I mean? Because he was a kid. He was baby, basically a baby. You know what I'm saying? Growing up, parentless, and uh, was murdered. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, Pac had some, he had some words he wanted to share with the crowd at that time. And 
they weren't uh they weren't nice words you know what i'm saying it, it wasn't nice about the shit he was saying he was he was um very emotional and some of the people in the crowd wasn't trying to hear that shit and so it kind of got it, it got really got really bad really quick and uh I want to send a shout out to the late great Jam Master J, who uh, who actually helped us out a lot in that situation because it was it wasn't looking good, man. You know what I'm saying? They had came to the hotel and you know a lot of people had came to the hotel and they was trying to get up in there. And, you know they wanted to continue. You know the so bullshit. Did a fight break out when you guys were on stage? Not necessarily a fight, man. People started throwing shit on stage. And so we started throwing shit back. You know what I'm saying? We was throwing microphones and Heineken bottles and they was throwing shit at us. And, you know, it got really, it got real funky real quick. And then we had to get up out of there because obviously, you know, we was outnumbered. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we out of bounds. You know what I'm saying? When this shit pops off. So we had to get the fuck up out of there, but it wasn't as simple as just getting up out of there. You know what I'm saying? And uh, a, a phone call was made, a couple phone calls was made, and, and the late, great Jam Master J was actually uh, largely responsible for us getting up out of there in one piece that day. Being on, doing all these shows and being on tours with Tupac, man, it, you know, is there any untold tour stories that you could share before we get up out of here? <sighs> You know, what's your most memorable time? Um, shit, a lot of the, a lot, my most memorable time is, is, you know, getting a chance to actually perform. Because in the beginning, you know, we was just roadies, you know what I'm saying? Like Pac took us through the whole process in this shit. And so we started out like carrying luggage and, you know what I'm saying? And doing shit like that before we even touched the microphone. And then finally, you know, we got a chance to get on the mic and actually, you know, do some performing. And, you know, I just remember being excited because I felt like we was gonna get a chance to contribute. You know what I mean? All I wanted to do was contribute to what was already established and, you know, hold my own weight in this shit, especially with somebody as great as Tupac Shakur. Do you remember the first time you performed with him? Ooh, that's a great fucking question, bro. Damn. You making me go back. <laughs> the first time we performed, it had to be like that summer of 92, you know what I'm saying? I don't even think we performed. Like I said, we wasn't we wasn't privy to touch the mic, but we got to get like like be on stage and stand in the in the back by the DJ. You know what I'm saying? And just actually see the crowd go crazy for this guy when he stepped on stage, you know what I'm saying? That was pretty dope. It was a, I think it was a show in Oakland. It was a show in Oakland. He had a show in Oakland. And we went. Oh, okay, right when you went out there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's what's up, man. Hey, man. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, man. And, uh, dope interview, man. Dope yeah. history. Uh, yeah. You know, just, just dope, man. Glad we got it done. Definitely, man. For sure. All right, bro. Yep. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam.